Hey everyone, Victor is here, your organic chemistry tutor, and in this video I want to talk about the Claisen condensation, which is a reaction where the two equivalents of the same ester, or maybe two different esters or ester and another carbonyl, going to produce the 1,3-dicarbonyl compound as the final product. Now, from the mechanistic perspective, the reaction is relatively straightforward. We are going to take an ester, ethyl acetate in this example, and the very first thing that I am going to do here, I'm going to deprotonate that alpha position to make the corresponding enolate, which is going to look like this. As esters are not particularly acidic, with the pKa typically being somewhere between 22 and 24, the equilibrium constant in this step is hardly impressive, which means that we are only going to be producing a very small amount of our enolate, and the rest of our reaction mixture is just going to be our unreacted ester. But that is the benefit for us, because since esters are somewhat electrophilic and enolates are nucleophilic, these two species now can react with each other. And in this case, I'm going to end up making a new bond between the alpha carbon of my enolate and carbon of my carbonyl. And of course, my curved arrows here going to be fairly straightforward for this type of uh, reaction, where I have the cascade of the electron density going from my nucleophilic enolate all the way to my electrophilic ester, giving me the following negatively charged tetrahedral intermediate, and the new bond that I have just formed is right over here. Now, from this point, like for many reactions of carboxylic acid derivatives, once we have our tetrahedral intermediate, we are going to get rid of our leaving group, which in this case is going to be this ethoxide. So I'm going to label that as my leaving group, and I'm going to show that we are going to kick that out of our molecule, making what looks like our final product, just rotated in space uh, compared to what I drew above, and the ethoxide anion floating around. But here is the catch. The thing is, the pKa of these protons that we have between our carbonyls is going to be somewhere between 9 and 13, depending on the exact nature of my molecule, which means that this ethoxide that I have just produced in this reaction is too basic to coexist with something that is so acidic in comparison. So what we are going to see is that this ethoxide is going to immediately snatch that proton off, reanalyzing our molecule and giving us corresponding enolate. And now, because these protons in between the carbonyls that I got in my product are so acidic in comparison to what we had at the beginning of the reaction, this acid-base step, this proton transfer, is actually going to have a drastically different equilibrium constant, somewhere around 10 to the 5th, 10 to the 6th, depending on the nature of the molecules again. And because that proton transfer is so favorable, that that last step is going to be the entire driving force for our reaction. So remember, whenever you are doing your Claisen condensation, you must have an intermediate, like what I have over here, that can be enolized. If you cannot enolize the product of your nucleophilic attack in your Claisen condensation, that is not going to be your final product. The molecule is going to decompose and go back to the starting materials because every step here is an equilibrium and every step until the very last proton transfer is unfavorable. Which means that the entire reason for this reaction going in the direction where we want it to go is that last proton transfer. No proton transfer, no reaction in other words. Now, once we have our enolate product, that is where our acidic workup is going to come into play. So during our acidic workup, we are going to reprotonate our molecule, essentially getting rid of our enolate, giving us our final product, a 1,3-dicarbonyl. In this particular case, that is going to be a 3-keto ester, or sometimes we also call it beta-keto ester. So yes, this mechanism looks kind of funny because we end up with the same product twice, once in the middle of our mechanism and then again at the end after our acidic workup, but as I've mentioned, Mentioned, the very first time we come across our product over here, that product gets immediately enolized.
localized. That's why we're not isolating it at that point. It's just physically impossible. We have to reprotonate the intermediate in order to actually get that product. And here is one other thing that I want to mention before we look at more examples, and that is the fact that the beta keto esters actually typically exist in the enol form due to the intramolecular hydrogen bonding and the extended conjugation that stabilizes that entire system. However, even though that is a more thermodynamically stable form, we still traditionally show those molecules in the keto form regardless. So don't be surprised if your instructor insists on this depiction over here instead of the more thermodynamically stable table that I have on the right side of the screen here. Now, let's look at an example. I'm going to take a slightly more complex ester here, ethyl butyrate or ethyl butanoate, if you like the IOPAC name, and like in the previous case, I'm going to treat it with sodium ethoxide and then do my acidic workup at the end. Now, in this case, I'm going to start by identifying the alpha position right next to my carbonyl, so I know that that is the position that we are going to deproton to make our enolate. So I'm going to bring my ethoxide, yeet that proton off, and make my enolate over here. Now, from this point, I'm going to bring the second equivalent of my ester, looking like this, and I do recommend that whenever you are drawing these uh, equations, whenever you're drawing your mechanisms, you draw those esters one under the other one, because this way it's going to be a little bit easier to visualize your products and how the bonds are being made in these molecules. So, in this case, like in the previous case, our electrons are going to go from our nucleophile to our electrophile. And again, like before, we are going to make a new carbon-carbon bond between this alpha position over here and the carbon of our carbonyl. So we are going to make the following tetrahedral intermediate, and I have highlighted my new bond that I have over here in orange, so it's a little bit more obvious. Now, like in the previous case, my tetrahedral intermediate is going to lose lose my leaving group, which in this case is again going to be my ethoxide over here. So electrons from the oxygen going to go here, kick my leaving group out, and recreate my carbonyl. But we know that we cannot take that as our final product, because we still have a proton right over here between my carbonyls, and that proton is comparatively acidic. So the ethoxide that we have just produced in this reaction going to come in, snatch that product, and reform the enolate right away. But now, when we have our enolate, we can do our acidic workup. So I'm going to bring my acid and reprotonate my molecule like so, giving me my final product, the 1,3-dicarbonyl compound. And of course, if I wanted to draw it in a slightly more traditional way, where this part of the molecule is my linear chain, I will have a molecule looking like this. Now, just like with the aldol condensation reaction and many other reactions of carbonyls, there is, of course, an easy shortcut here that you can use to quickly predict the product of your Claisen condensation. So let's look at this example again, the one that I just worked through. In order to predict my product quickly and easily, the first thing that I'm going to do, I will identify my alpha position, which is obviously the position right next to my carbonyl. So in order to predict my product, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to copy my starting material, I'm going to redraw it one more time underneath, and I know that I'm going to be making a connection between the alpha position of one molecule and the carbonyl of the other molecule. So I'm going to be combining those two carbons. And my ethoxide that I have over here, that part is going to become my leaving group. Let's copy that part one more time over here. What that means, I'm going to lose my leaving group, so I'm going to erase my leaving group over here. Since I'm going to be making a new bond between my alpha carbon and my carbonyl to make my life a little bit easier, what I'm going to do here, I will just rotate this molecule in space, like so, let's say like that, and now I'm just going to connect those two carbons 
And there you have it, that is your product. Pretty easy, right? Now, where things really become fun is when we have a mixed or crossed glycine condensation. And that's going to be the case, similar to, let's say, mixed aldol condensation, when we are reacting two different carbonyls with each other. In this case, two different esters. So, let's say I'm going to try to do the reaction between the ethyl acetate, which is the starting material for my first example that I looked at today, and and ethyl butanoate, which was my second molecule that I looked at today. And the conditions here are still going to be the same, just sodium methoxide, and then we are going to have our acidic workup. Now, in this case, since both of my esters are inalyzable, I have the inalyzable position over here on my left molecule, and I also have an inalyzable position on my right molecule, it means that both of those can and will create a certain amount of the enolate floating in solution, and then those enolates can potentially react with my esters. So let's say I'm going to call my molecules A and B over here. So if I attempt this reaction, then I can have four possible combinations. I can have an enolate from molecule A reacting with another equivalent of A, giving me the following product. I can have enolate from the molecule A reacting with with the ester B giving me this, we can have ester A reacting with the enolate coming from molecule B, which would look like this, and finally we can have enolate from molecule B reacting with its own ester, giving us the product that looks like this. So obviously it's a mess, and if you attempt to do a reaction like that, best of luck trying to separate all of those products, it's going to make a really ugly soup. So the way we can control that is via the selective inalization, similar to how we did it in the case of the mixed aldol condensation. So let's say we are only interested in the combination where the enolate from molecule A reacts with our ester B. That means that we no longer can use conditions in which all of our compounds are going to be cooking together. Instead, we are going to start by taking our ester A and performing complete inalization with a very strong base, something like LDA or maybe sodium hydride, although typically we do use LDA for these purposes. Now, because of how insanely powerful LDA is as a base, we are going to see 100% inalization here with an equilibrium constant of something like 10 to the 12th power or something crazy like that. So now, once I have my enolate, I'm going to add my second compound, my other ester, and let those guys react with each other, making a new bond between our alpha position of the enolate and carbon of the carbonyl, but now, since one molecule is 100% enolized and another one is 0% enolized, the majority of our molecules are going to react the way we want them to react, giving us the following tetrahedral intermediate, which going to quickly lose our living group, making our dicarbonyl plus the ethoxide, which, as per usual, going to immediately snatch one of those protons from between our carbonyls, making the corresponding enolate, and the only thing that is left for us in this case is to do our acidic workup to reprotonate our molecule and get our final product. So remember, if you have two different esters, then selectively enolize one of those with a strong base like LDA, and then add the second ester to it, and you're going to get the product that you actually want to get in your reaction instead of a crazy mix. And another interesting application of this chemistry that we are going to see within the scope of our course is going to be the reaction between ketones and esters in a glycine style condensation. So let's say I have this acetophenone over here, which is an aromatic ketone, and I'm going to use my ester that I have already used before here, ethyl acetate. And in this case, I can actually mix both of those in just simple sodium ethoxide solution and then follow up with my acidic workup, and I am not going to be too scared about any unwanted side reactions. And here is why. The typical PKA value for ketones is about 19, while the esters PKA is 22 to 24, so we're looking at at least thousand times difference in their acidity, which means that if we are treating both of these molecules 
molecules in the solution together with the same base, the left molecule, my ketone in this case, is going to be analyzed to a much greater extent than my ester, which means that the majority of the enolate that I have present in my solution will be coming from my ketone, which means that purely from the statistical perspective, the ketone here is going to be my nucleophile and ester will have to play a role of my electrophile especially if I want to take a ester in a slight excess. So once I have some amount of my enolate from my ketone floating around, it will react with my carbonyl of the ester, like so, making a new bond between the alpha carbon of my enolate and the carbon of my carbonyl, making the corresponding tetrahedral intermediate, then we are going to kick our living group out, giving us dicarbonyl and of course our ethoxide, which will immediately deprotonate our dicarbonyl over here, making the corresponding enolate. And the only thing that is left for us here is to do the acidic workup to reprotonate our molecule, giving us our final product. Pretty cool, right? So, as you can see, the Kleisen condensation is a pretty fun and versatile reaction with a bit of a trick up its sleeve when it comes to the mechanism. So, make sure you practice your mechanism and know how to predict your products so you don't get caught off guard during the exam. And as always, thank you for watching. If you learned something new today, you can tell me that by hitting the like button, subscribing and leaving me a comment below. Check out this video next and I will see you next time.